back. David Pan here with Professor Penn Podcast. Episode number 84, which I title Divide and Conquer. So I've entered social media quite fully now, and I was over the weekend dropping into the DeSantis crowd uh, of paid political operatives who were putting up stuff on X constantly. And I, you know, I can't imagine that the American people don't know that these people are paid. Some of them are from Minnesota. And I just want to say, in case you know you're following me now, which you should be, because we're engaged and we're not going to stop unless you block me. I'm not here to, to shill for Trump or for DeSantis. We are truth-seeking media. We're looking for the truth. Now you're going to say, oh, you played a Trump ad. I didn't play the Trump ad for Trump. I played the Trump ad because here on the Professor Penn podcast, we're seeking the truth. And if you watch that again, President Trump is putting forth images and making commitments like he put out a tweet. He's going to release all the information about the Kennedy assassination if he's elected to the presidency for a second time. Some of my listeners will say for a third time. Now, he lost. Doesn't matter how he lost. He lost. It's politics. It's a brass knuckle game. The fact that the Democrat is 20 years ahead of the Republican in playing the game, that's just politics. That's called having your having it together. I'm going to try not to swear today. Uh, but the fact that he's showing Bill Clinton with George Bush and George Wallace. You know, go back and look at the history of the podcasts. You know, these things are not impenetrable. We just have chosen not to look at the reality within which we live. And President Trump is saying, oh, oh, there's some secrets here that I would like you to think about, I would like to reveal. Like George Bush with Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford, Gerald Ford on the Warren Commission, which was where the one, the lone gunman theory was ratified and it was a cover-up according to our own Congress. And there's George Bush, who was a director of the CIA, ambassador to China, one of the spookier presidents that we've had. Excuse me. A little fired up this morning. I haven't been with you. Of course, those of you who noticed I was on with Royce this past Friday night, but The Professor Penn podcast took a week off, and uh, we're back at it now. We've all returned from our holidays. My young producer was out of town, and I decided to take a a week off because coming up with this content takes a lot of work. You know, I'm not coming up here and just extemporaneously spouting off. I really spend a lot of time trying to identify those places that we, the people, need to focus our attention. We're going to do that a little bit today and more on Thursday. And I want to thank Free People Radio for giving us this venue, Truth Seeking Media, our sponsor, TireGet.com. We have other sponsors, uh, PrecinctStrategy.com. Please go there. We want to support the movement of American citizens into political action because there's no cavalry coming. This goes to my new friends in the DeSantis movement. You, know, you guys are, I mean, I'm reading this. Oh, DeSantis, he's the greatest candidate in my lifetime. Oh, he's so different. No, I, you know, Yale, Harvard, lawyer, military. This guy is checked every box on the way to being a presidential contender. And this doesn't mean I have great confidence in President Trump, Trump because you saw from that video his one enduring and lasting contribution because, of course, President Biden undid everything else that President Trump created. The one feature that's enduring is moving the uh, U.S. Embassy in Israel to Jerusalem. Quite a provocative act, quite a symbolic act, for some quite an eschatological act. Uh, but the point is we're, we're rapidly leaving the era of BS, and we're going to get into the era of put your cards on the table. And this is why I like this piece. We saw Soros. We saw Clinton. We saw Hillary Clinton. We saw Bush, Ford. We saw a catalog, a a catalog, a, a gallery of rogues, a gallery of rogues 
that we, the American people, have put up with because, quite frankly, our spiritual borders are eroded. And when our internal, our personal spiritual borders are eroded, every manner of virus and bacteria can penetrate our, our spiritual life and corrupt us. And that's where we're at. So what are we doing here? We're getting a very clear message that I want all of these, all of the people that are participating in this community together. We have a very clear message. And I'll, in the live chat, if you'd like me to uptake some other ideas, boy, that's why we're a community. So please come on in, everybody participate. We have to restore borders, both spiritual and physical. If we have our spiritual borders re, you know, restored, the physical borders will just appear as if by miracle. We have to turn debt into assets so young people like my producer, Elia, has a life of, of, of a blessing instead of a life of debt slavery. We have to turn debt into assets. We just crested over $34 trillion. Our Congress has now agreed on a spending package, which, oh, you know, it's $1.6 trillion. Great, great. Another one point. Put it on the credit card. That's exactly what they're going to do. We've got to turn debt into assets, and we have to end the endless war, which we're going to talk about tonight and on Thursday. Um, I haven't had a chance to pray yet today, so you can join me. And we pray because we need supernatural help. For those of us who do not believe in God, if we succumb to this tyranny, you'll have all the evidence you need that there is no God. If for some reason we miraculously restore our republic and our sacred honor and we continue to live as a free people, free to pursue communion with God, which is something else we'll be talking about, what does freedom mean? We need to understand what freedom means. So I need to pray, and please join me. Blessed are you, God and King of all worlds. Thank you for creating the light and the dark. Blessed are you, God and King of all worlds. Thank you for creating me in your image. Blessed are you, God and King of all worlds. Thank you for making me an American. Blessed are you, God and King of all worlds. Thank you for making me free. Blessed are you, God and King of all worlds. Thank you for feeding the people. Blessed are you, God and King of all worlds. Thank you for releasing the bound. Blessed are you, God and King of all worlds. Thank you for raising up the downtrodden. Blessed are you, God and King of all worlds. Thank you for creating the heavens and earth. Blessed are you, God and King of all worlds. Thank you for providing for all my needs. Blessed are you, God and King of all worlds. Thank you for directing my path. Blessed are you, God and King of all worlds. Thank you for our American courage. Blessed are you, God and King of all worlds. Thank you for crowning America with glory. Blessed are you, God and King of all worlds. Thank you for restoring strength to the weary. Blessed are you, God and King of all worlds. Thank you for sending your only begotten Son to die on the cross, that I might be saved. Forgive us, Father, for we have sinned. Pardon us, our King, for we have willfully transgressed. For you pardon and forgive. Blessed are you, God and King of all worlds, who is gracious and ever willing to forgive. I want to lay some predicates for today's podcast. Um, and for those of you who are anti-scriptural, anti-God, anti-faith, but for some reason you're here, you know, there's a lot of ways to read uh, the Bible, the Old and the New Testament. One can read it as a foundation of our faith. And if one reads it that way and gives over to it, one will discover that it's a system that brings about healing, health, and well-being. All its path, all of its paths are paths of peace. And we can discover that together if we want to go about it in a, in, from a spiritual perspective. If we want to go about it from a historical perspective, that's also quite critical. And what we've had over the last hundred years since the advent of uh, the progressive era of education is a continuing uh, minimization of the Bible as a historical document and its replacement with Darwinism. 
and we we lose so much color, so much insight into the human experience when we minimize the Bible just as a historical document. Forget about it. Forget just for a second about it as a spiritual document. In Exodus nineteen six, it says, "And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation." These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So we're going to be talking tonight about anti-Semitism and divide and conquer and what's going on because I'm so active in this social media and I see so much unrestricted anti-Semitism, which transitions very quickly into racism and then xenophobia and all of the um, energies which the left have used quite successfully to discredit previous populist movements in this country. So when we the people stand up and start to assert ourselves as a self-governing body of American citizens, and we have this anti-Semitism and racism that's shot through because it's we the people and it's there, it's in our heads, the left quite is, is, is quite skilled at destroying the movement because of its ideological shortcomings. And one of the things we want to do together as a community is stay focused on three critical issues. Spiritual borders, which create physical borders, turning debt into assets, and ending the wars for the well-being of the people. This is a movement about human well-being, not about finding scapegoats about why we're so screwed up. And what I'm going to be working on this week is saying, hey, there's plenty of blame to go around. And if we're going to be scriptural just for a second from a spiritual perspective, why do we spend so much time pointing at the speck in each other's eyes when we have these giant logs in our own eyes? Now, those of you who know the New Testament know that I'm paraphrasing the words of Christ, and they're very appropriate words. Let's let's get our own personal houses in order before we start attacking other groups, because he who is without sin will cast the first stone. Now, in Deuteronomy 28, and this is very critical, this is about the law. Deuteronomy was about the law. And I'm, I'm going through this because I'm, I'm setting up the rest of the podcast, so bear with me. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of thy Lord, thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on, a, on high above all the nations of the earth, talking to the Israelites. And the text goes through all these blessings that the Israelites, the Jewish people, will receive if they follow the word. The Lord shall establish thee a holy people unto himself, as he hath sworn unto thee, if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways, and all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy ground, in the land which the Lord has sworn unto thy fathers to give to thee. Conversely, if the Jewish people do not follow the commandments, There's a whole series of very intense curses. And when I was reading through them, I found some of them in my own life, which would make me feel that I'm cursed. And I am to some degree because I am of this tradition, and this tradition has lost its way. We're trying to get it back together. I'm trying to get it back together. So let's not be setting up genocide when hundreds of thousands of people are waking up. You know, let's not let's not pull the trigger too quickly. But there's all these curses. Uh, curse shall thou be in the city, and curse shall thou be in the field. Curse shall be thy basket and thy store. This is when you don't follow the, the law. Curse shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land, and the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. It goes on and on with curses. I mean, these curses are terrifying. You can go read them in Deuteronomy 28, because they go on. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee and overtake thee till thou be destroyed because thou hearkenest not, a t- not unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he, which he commanded thee. 
because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladfulness of heart. You know, it just goes on and on. You got to go read this. These curses, I mean, they just go on and on. Wow. And this is the curse of the law. And then we have this intellectual, philosophical, historical event, which is the life of Jesus. And in Galatians 3, in the New Testament, there's a comment about the law. And it says, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? There was a transition from submission to the law, and since we all fall short, there's a problem here, right? And then there became the issue of faith, faith in God. And there was a transition that was made for we the people about faith. Does God give you his spirit to spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law or because you believe what you heard. This is Galatians 5. Galatians 8, the scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. Quote, all nations will be blessed through you. So those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. These are the kind of ideas that take a long time. Now, you can have faith overnight or in, the, or in, a, in, a, in the snap of a finger. But to understand the tradition takes work, work. You got to get the word down inside you. And there was a transition here because the, the Sanhedrin, the scribes, the Pharisees, this, this slavery to the rule of law had led to a corruption of the spirit. And it was the act of Christ that allowed people to transcend that trap and get a direct relationship with God. And these are things we need to really think about individually and as a community so we understand what the heck is going on here. And I'm set, I'm using this, I'm going to come back to this, this transition from the law that was the province of the Jews to first for the Jew and then for the Gentile into a spirit-based or a faith-based life, which actually is memorialized in our founding documents here in the United States of America, where a creator grants us unalienable rights, that being to pursue our life and our liberty and happiness, to have life and liberty and pursue happiness. So this, there is a, a, a through line from ancient Israel into the modern period of the New Testament, into the establishment of America in 1776. We're going to work on this. There's a lot to be found here. And I think why I played this Trump campaign ad was not to shill for Trump, but to say, again, that President Trump is bringing forth the hidden into plain view. And if we're going to escape this, the truth will set us free. And if we're going to have some truth-telling, okay, that's very important. But it's not what you put on a video, it's what you do for policy, and we're going to hold every politician accountable from top to bottom because they represent us. They are our elected representatives. If we the people are engaged, we have influence. And where are we at right now? Well, we're escalating. We're escalating very quickly. Quickly. Here's a few things that happen as we go up the ladder of escalation. Since I saw you last, Ukrainian President, President Jelinsky called for a mobilization of, a number, of, another, of another 450,000 to 500,000 new conscripts to restock the Ukrainian army because they've suffered tremendous casualties. So rather than sitting down and cutting a deal, they're doubling down. And you know, 
This isn't him, right? He's taking his orders from where? From we the people. We the people have got to take responsibility. Don't say it's them, they. No, it's us. We have the power if we reclaim it and become active. That's what I'm asking all of us to do. Be active in any way that you can. And there's almost an infinite way, number of ways, to become active politically beyond consuming politics as entertainment. Politics is an action philosophy. The U.S. granted access to 15 military bases in Finland under a new deal. In Finland, 15 bases. Now, Finland, uh, Elia, do you know that Finland fought a war with Russia? No, you don't know. It's yes or no. You're, look, you're scanning your memory banks. Actually, in recent memory, Finland fought two wars with Russia. The first one was called the Winter War, which broke out on 30 November 1939 and was concluded on 13 March 1940. It was a brutal war, and the Russians tried to uh, take over Finland. And if you take a look at the map, and I'm going to urge you to go look at the map because you've got to see it for yourself, Finland is very strategic in the Barents Sea and in getting uh, uh, Russian naval vessels out into the blue waters of the ocean. And the Finns and the Russians have a border, and they fought a war. It was a very cold war, fought in the wintertime. And the Finns gave the Russians what fur, and they were not able to defeat the Finns. And then, of course, the Finns very soon thereafter fought what was called the Continuation War. And guess what they did? They allied themselves with the Nazis. Now, I'm not trying to, trying to say the Finns were Nazis, but the fact is they did fight with the Nazis, which would mean they were very sympathetic to the Nazis. And here is the United States of America getting access to 15 military bases Right now, today, 2024, in Finland, which has a border on Russia. You think that's provocative? I do. We're escalating. We're going up the ladder of escalation. Oh, here's a nice one. France, Germany, and the United States condemn Iran's increased uranium enrichment. So, uh, you know, the uh, Western powers are up in the ante on the Iranians, who, of course, are quite threatened. They're just saying we're going to build a bomb because we need it to survive. And there's, you know, our, our country and our allies are saying, well, we'd like to have a negotiated solution. But they're really putting the Iranians on notice that if they don't back down, it's time to go to war. So we're watching this escalation. First it's talk, and then it's killing. North Korea let loose uh, two rocket and missile barrages on South Korean territory. Not reported in our news. I don't know why. It's a major event. All these things are interrelated. There has been assassinations of dozens of Iranian Revolutionary Guard members in senior leadership throughout Syria and even in Iran. There was a giant butchery in Iran. Uh, President Trump took credit during his administration for assassinating the leader of the Revolutionary Guard, a guy named Soleimani, you might remember it, and because he was killed in this very uh, intense and symbolic way uh, every year, and he was a martyr for the Iranian regime, every year they have a commemoration of his death on the anniversary of his death, and this year when that happened, two bombs went off and about 100 people were killed and a couple hundred people were wounded. This was inside Iran. That's quite provocative, isn't it? Hezbollah and Israel are doing a tit-for-tat at the Israeli-Lebanon border. Constant violence there, constant killing. There's continuing attacks on U.S. bases in the region and on shipping that's trying to go through the Red Sea to get to the Suez. Uh, The war on Yemen is imminent. There was a joint statement from the governments of the United States, Australia, Bahrain, Belgium, Canada, Denmark, Germany, Italy, Japan, Netherlands, New Zealand, Republic of Korea, Singapore, and the United Kingdom. Recognizing the broad consensus as expressed by 44 countries around the world on December 19, 2023, 
as well as the statement by the U.N. Security Council on December 1st, 2023, condemning Houthi attacks against commercial vessels transiting the Red Sea, and in light of the ongoing attacks, including significant escalation over the past week targeting commercial vessels, these countries hereby reiterate the following and warn the Houthis against further attacks. So, you know, the Iranians are getting warned, the Houthis are getting warned, the assets are in the region. We're getting ready to get down here, okay? We're getting ready to get down. Oh, but the football game was on. They had the uh, uh, some award show that got, I can't even, what was the award show? Was it Golden Globes? I never watched it even when things were Pacific. Not interested in such things. Because I don't like to see artistry elevated into, you know, into, into some kind of, uh, these people are some kind of demigods because they can sing and they can dance. That's great. Love that they can sing and create. Fantastic. Uh, let's all learn how to do it in our own way. Not all of us are as gifted as, let's say, uh, Count Basie or Dizzy Gillespie or uh, Kanye West. But we, we can strive. And we might find through uh, giving ourselves over to the spiritual that we're a lot more talented than we think we are. We just have to work at it instead of just continuously being a consumer of other people entertaining us. Let's entertain ourselves. There is a thought for you. All right, we're going to talk a little bit now about the, the history and what I'm really driving at here today. But before we do that, I'd like to drop in a word from our sponsor. Winter was late this year. Oh boy, but it's, it's, it's arrived. We got snow everywhere. It's cold everywhere. Please be safe. If you're sliding around out there and you want to buy a new all-season tire or a winter tire, go to TireGet.com. That's T-I-R-E-G-E-T.com. It's a one-stop shop for all your tire needs. you got to buy your tires from someone. When you buy, buy them from TireGet, you are funding the movement. We have great customer service. You call in, you email in, we'll contact you back. We'll make sure you get exactly the tire that you need. Not any more, not any less. Just right. We're here for you. Target.com. This is a great way to fund the movement. It's a great way to get the tires that you need. And we're going to do your service. So you pick your tire and we'll service the tires. We'll get them on your vehicle. That's T I R E G E T.com. And thank you very much for listening. All right. Back to the show. General Patton. Elia, are you familiar with the General Patton? Is that, it doesn't ring a bell to Elia. See, it's amazing to me how things just drift away. And General Patton was a very important figure, and he's been dredged up by the uh, anti-Semites and the racists uh, as a paragon of virtue, and we're going to talk about that. But first, let's just get into how General Patton's status was revived originally. Elliot, could you play number two, please? This was the number 67th hit in 1970. Fire and Rain, James Taylor. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, this is interesting. You know, James Taylor, I was a a teenager, and this was a vision of masculinity that I'd never seen before. He looked a little bit Christ-like, but he was, you know, soft and emotional. We didn't have a template for the soft and emotional man. James Taylor was a was a pathfinder, a pace setter, a brain. This was part of the hippie movement and the uh demascul- demasculinization or the labeling of, of masculinity as being toxic that started in the 1960s, part of this whole period of time. And this was destabilizing. Now nobody really said it at the time, uh, but we kind of intuitively knew this was different a different uh, model for young men to pursue. And at the very same time that this came out, this was the number 67th hit on the top 100 in 1970, there was an Academy Award-winning movie about a very famous, and this guy's going to be famous a 1,000 years from now, if there is a 1,000 years from now, with human history, uh, you know, 
Man can't stop the time. There is going to be a future. We just don't know if we're going to be part of it. Uh, George Scott, a very famous actor, probably Elliot doesn't know his name either, fantastic actor. Um, I urge you all to go find General Buck Turgeson in Dr. Strangelove. George Scott was fantastic. One of his most famous roles, he played George Patton. This movie came out on April 2nd, 1970. At the same time, uh, James Taylor was uh, uh, debuting this new image of masculinity. Let's get into the previous image that had been around since forever. Let's play number three, please. Oh, by the way, before you start this, try to clean up the sound on this. I've taken this from a, a, a reel where I'm hoping we can get this up because, as you know, movies get protected. This is an Instagram reel. Try to clean up the sound. Thank you very much. I want you to remember that no bastard ever won war by dying for his country. He won it by making the other poor dumb bastard die for his country. Men, all this stuff you heard about America not wanting to fight, wanting to stay out of the war, is a lot of horse dung. Americans traditionally love to fight. All real Americans love the sting of battle. When you were kids, you all admired the champion marble shooter, the fastest runner, the big league ball players, the toughest boxers. Americans love a winner and will not tolerate a loser. Americans play to win all the time. I wouldn't give a hoot in hell for a man who lost and laughed. That's why Americans have never lost and will never lose a war. Because the very thought of losing is hateful to Americans. Now, an army is a team. It lives, eats, sleeps, fights as a team. This individuality stuff is a bunch of crap. The biggest bastards who wrote that stuff about individuality for the Saturday Evening Post don't know anything more about real battle than they do about fornicating. Now we have the finest food and equipment, the best spirit, and the best men in the world. You know, by God, I actually pity those poor bastards we're going up against. By God, I do. We're not just going to shoot the bastards. We're going to cut out their living guts and use them to grease the treads of our tanks. We're going to murder those lousy Hun bastards by the bushel. Now, some of you boys, I know, are wondering whether or not you'll chicken out under fire. Don't worry about it. I can assure you that you will all do your duty. The Nazis are the enemy. Wade into them. Spill their blood. Shoot them in the belly. When you put your hand into a bunch of goo that a moment before was your best friend's face. You know what to do. Now, there's another thing I want you to remember. I don't want to get any messages saying that we are holding our position. We're not holding anything. Let the Hun do that. We are advancing constantly, and we're not interested in holding on to anything except the enemy. We're going to hold on to him by the nose, and we're going to kick him in the ass. We're going to kick the hell out of him all the time, and we're going to go through him like crap through a goose. Now, there's one thing that you men will be able to say when you get back home. And you may thank God for it. Thirty years from now, when you're sitting around your fireside, 
with your grandson on your knee and he asks you, what did you do in the great World War II? You won't have to say, well, I shoveled shit in Louisiana. All right, now you sons of bitches, you know how I feel. Well, I will be proud to lead you wonderful guys into battle anytime, anywhere. That's all. Yeah, that's some masculinity for you, right? For my generation as a teenager, it was great. I remember my father took me to this movie. My father, the leftist, he loved it because these images of masculinity and of American exceptionalism were so woven into our culture at that time. Uh, so we had these two forces. We had this growing new image of the James Taylor male, and we had this pre-existing tradition of uh, military exceptionalism and masculinity as portrayed so eloquently there by George C. Scott. And he brought back into um, popular consciousness the uh, life of General George Patton, who was a rock star during World War II. And when I say a rock star, I mean a rock star, like the rock stars that, you know, threw televisions out of windows and trashed hotel rooms. This guy was no rule follower. Uh, he had a very um, troubled career. He was a great military tactician. He led the U U.S. military uh, in its campaign to rout the Germans in North Africa. He was engaged in the Sicily campaign, the Italy campaign. His, uh, his forces rescued the U.S. garrison at Bastogne and turned the potential defeat of the uh, Battle of the Bulge into a victory. This guy was fantastic. But all along the way, with all of his military brilliance, he was always getting in trouble for the things he said and did. He slapped some soldiers in a hospital who were there uh, amongst the wounded. They were there for military fatigue or you know combat fatigue. In other words, they, they uh, had uh, you know emotional problems like James Taylor. I think George C. Scott would have slapped the lips right off of James Taylor for acting like that with the long hair. Well, this was not George, George C. Scott's Patton. Patton would not have uh, been very supportive of the hippies. And uh, he has been erected as a cudgel. Right now today, he's become very important in the uh, alternative right as a... Um, as a figure who was, um, well, he was uh, allegedly uh, murdered by his own military. Uh, this is one of the great first conspiracy theories that people don't know about. He was in a car accident right after the war, and there's people that think he died. Not by natural causes, but by assassination. I don't know. There's very sketchy details about this. But we do know, we do know, that he did many provocative acts and said many provocative things, and he's been erected as this paragon of white nationalism because he said certain things like, I'll read this to you. If what we are doing to the Germans is liberty, then give me death. I can't see how Americans can sink so low. It is Semitic, and I am sure of it. There is a very apparent Semitic influence in the press. They are trying to do two things. First, implement communism, and second, see that all the business of German ancestry and non-Jewish antecedents are thrown out of their jobs. They have utterly lost the Anglo-Saxon conception of justice and feel that a man can be kicked out because nobody, because somebody else says he is a Nazi. They were evidently quite shocked when I told them I would kick nobody out without successful proof of guilt before a court of law. So here's a very famous general at the end of the war uh, who was in charge of the post-war you know, administration of Germany, speaking out against the Jews, 
uh, speaking out against the press, uh, labeling the Jews as being the harbingers of communism, and he's being portrayed as this great example of, uh, of whiteness, whatever that is. And why I say whatever that is, because as it turns out, Patton was English, Irish, Scots-Irish, Scottish, French, and Welsh in his ancestry. Uh, that would make him a mutt. He was not a pure anything. So we get into this idea about whiteness, it gets a little strange right off the bat. He was a mutt. His great-grandmother came from an, arist an aristocratic Welsh family. He descended from many Welsh lords. Uh, he had an extensive military background. Patton believed that he had formerly lived as a soldier and took pride in mystical ties with his ancestors. Though he was not directly descended from George Patton, George Patton, from George Washington, excuse me, Patton traced some of his English colonial roots to George Washington's great-grandfather. So this guy, you know, weaved himself into the uh, historical lineage that became America. But really, he was, uh, he was really just trained in a secret society, and that would be West Point, the U.S. military. And uh, it was really how he was trained. I mean, he didn't have a specific lineage. He was the product of a lot of intermarriage amongst different groups, and he was trained into the secret society of the military, and he had certain ideas, and he was very prominent, and he brought those forth. And what's being bandied about the alt-right right now is his most famous post-war comment, and I will quote, and I will read carefully. Gentlemen, I have come this morning to the inexcusable conclusion that we have fought on the wrong side. This entire war we should have fought with the fascists against the communists and not the other way around. I fear that perhaps in 50 years, America will pay a dear price and become a land of corruption and degenerate morals. This was spoken on July 21st, 1945, and not long thereafter, Patton was dead and almost forgotten until he was revived in popular culture by that Academy, Academy Award-winning performance by George C. Scott. Well, let's go on and talk about being favored by God. This is not just for the Jews, because it was first for the Jews and then for the Gentiles. Could you please play number four? See all your fights and stuff? All your, all your knockers is spectacular. You know what that means? All this good stuff happening to you, you know what that means? That you're favored by God. When you're favored by God, you're also favored by the devil. He's coming for you too. <laughs> so you just gotta be strong and stay on the right side. Whose side are you gonna go on? He's gonna give you power too. He's gonna get in your head too, but it's whose side are you gonna stay with? You stay with who brought you here. Mm. You, stay, you go home with the guy that brought you to the dance. Play it one more time, would you? Because Mike Tyson is such an interesting philosopher. See all your fights and stuff? All your, all your knockers is spectacular. You know what that means? All this good stuff happening to you, you know what that means? That you're favored by God. When you're favored by God, you're also favored by the devil. He's coming for you too. <laughs> so you just gotta be strong and stay on the right side. Whose side are you gonna go on? He's gonna give you power too. He's gonna get in your head too, but it's whose side you're gonna stay with. You stay with who brought you here. Mm. You stay you go home with the guy that brought you to the dance. Thank you. The uh interviewer's laugh was a way to cover up fear. That was not a funny statement. That was a very serious statement from a man who knows what he's talking about, because we know his history. And what he's saying is if if we're favored, if we're blessed, we're tested. And that's one of the things that I, I have some, some strength with because I've already been through these tests and I failed some of them. And because God is always willing to forgive and I've served my sentence, it makes me more difficult to corrupt this trip. And that's part of becoming a man. 
is is putting yourself out there and making mistakes. It's, it's really not getting knocked down. That's the problem. It's not getting off the mat. That's the problem. Getting knocked down is part of being in the fight. So here we are, America. We're knocked down. Are we going to get up? That's the question. That's how history will judge this country, not by the fact that we've been corrupted. Will we address the issue individually as individual American citizens and have the courage and the integrity to turn this around as our forefathers have done many times previously? Now it's on us. And where we're heading here now is um, an understanding of what's going on with this anti-Semitism and racism and how it's going to be used to discredit an ideological position of borders, dead into assets, and ending war. And why would anybody want to discredit that? Wouldn't that be an ideology that the vast majority of Americans could get behind if we made it very simple, very plain, and didn't allow all the other BS to get associated with it? I mean, we all need borders. What happens when we don't have borders is we kill ourselves. We need borders. We intuitively know as living organisms that if we eat too much, we don't feel good. That's a border. Having some borders around our consumption of food, for example. We all know that being debt slaves doesn't feel good. We would like to have assets. I used to use the word equity, but that's been co-opted. So I was on with Royce, and Royce riffed in the word assets, and I thought that was great. We want to have assets as the American people. We want to have net worth, not debt. And then the final one, how does it profit us or benefit us to be continuously at war? And in the preamble to to tonight's show, I was talking about all this escalation. I mean, the world is at war. This is not going to make us well or rich. War does not make us, we the people. It's going to benefit a handful of people. But I'm not on that list. You're not on that list of people who benefit from war. <laughs> Come on. That's, that's the people being used as cannon fodder to enrich the, a small group of oligarchs. And why do they have the power to do this to us? Because we're not involved. We still have a constitutional republic that allows American citizens to practice the art of politics. And that's what I'm asking us all to do in our own ways. Like, for example, I've become, two years ago, no social media interest, no social media skills. In two years, I've become quite good at it. Many of you are quite good at it. We have to have the courage to wade into these conversations and tell the truth about borders, about assets, and about ending war. Because I think this message will appeal to the vast majority of the American public if they recognize that one ideology, which is the globalist ideology, is it's not the opposite. It's a different ideology about climate change and social equity and democracy. But the result of that ideology is worldwide communism and poverty to save the earth, to right the wrongs of the colonial past, and to fight to maintain the post-World War II Democrat liberal order. That's about poverty for me and for all of us. So we're just coming up in our movement with with a different product to sell, with a different set of policies we want to see enacted about borders and assets and well-being, which means no killing of each other. And we have these people that are making it hard to implement this. Could you please play number five? We need to be like 100 or 200 million strong because they, they literally are trying to kill us. People are always talking about they, they are out of control, they are killing us. We have to identify who the real enemy is. We have, to, we have to know where does this infiltration come from. And when you really step back and take an honest look at every single level of our federal bureaucracy, 
There's one little nation state of Israel that everybody's afraid to talk about. It'll get you nuked off the internet. It'll get your Twitter shut down. It'll get you kicked off of Rumble. It'll scare advertisers away from doing business with you if you talk about Zionist infiltration. So if that's the one sensitive subject that nobody wants us to talk about, then I think it's pretty obvious that's the thing that we should be talking about. Uh, I, I, I get you know headache. what I want to talk about? You know what I want to, uh, listen, we're in the middle of World War III. And are Jews welcome to join the fight against the Sure, Lord? yeah, pick up, yeah, absolutely. Yes, real Jews or fake Khazars that want to kill us? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. We'll start with the end first. Real jo Jews or fake Khazars? Okay, that's great. What Stu Peters is saying is I'm a fake Jew because I have a Ukrainian background, which is where the Khazars were located. It's something that, you know, is spoken of very often in the alt-right that the Israelites are different than the Jews because the Khazars, which is a mafia of just despicable people, up took Judaism and it's an international cabal, a conspiracy to control the world. And Israel is the outgrowth of that and that, you know, our whole country is controlled by the Zionists. Okay, first of all, I was raised by Khazars, if that's what it was, or Ukrainian Jews. I grew up in that community. Nobody tried to get rich. People, paid, people prayed three times a day with humility. People visited the sick. They gave charity to the poor. They were kind constantly. They believed in God with all their heart, with all their might, and with all their soul. That was my experience. Now, it's a long time ago when I was raised by these people, and I'm not going to say that there aren't all kinds of people who wrap themselves in Judaism when, in fact, they're Darwinists. Just like there's all kinds of Protestants that do that and Catholics that do that. And what we're going to work on this week is, okay, you want to start picking on the Jews, Stu? Let's talk about the Catholics and the Jesuits. Let's talk about the Protestants who are the primary slave owners. And someone's going to say, yes, but the Jews financed the slave trade. Yeah, well, the Protestants held the whip in their hands and the shackles that were put on the feet and the, and the hands of the slaves. So, you know, all these groups, the Chinese, the Europeans, the Africans. You know, as Mike Tyson said, if you're chosen from any of these groups to be favored by God, evil comes and tempts you. And what's happened over the last, you know, 100 years since, well, 80 years since 45, when we had the last big bloodletting and we put into place this post-World War II Democrat liberal order, all of these groups have been obviously co-opted, and in fact, most of these groups have been co-opted for 2,000 years. 2,000 years of a gradual loss of sacred honor. So I'm, I just want to say to Stu Peters and to Nick Fuentes and all the people that are following them, we're a movement of inclusion that believes in healing, and believes in forgiveness. And, you know, Stu said all, you know, any Jews are welcome. Well, thanks, Stu. I'm in the movement. But when we openly are anti-Semitic or openly racist or openly xenophobic, all the American citizens that would join this movement because who is really going to be against spiritual borders, assets, and ending war? This is a winning platform. It's going to win fantastically because it's simple and true. Unless we get a bunch of folks blaming everybody else and scaring people so that they don't want to be involved because what they see is a, th a theocracy and hatred, which is going to prevent them from getting off the globalist plantation, also known as the Democrat plantation. It's going to block them. And we don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I want to see all who believe in spiritual borders, assets, and ending war to find a home in this movement. And Donald Trump is not perfect. We're not going to have a perfect leader. 
And I'm not even saying he's going to be the leader. It, we have to get away from cult of personality and get into ideas. You know, cult of personality, that's almost like ethno-nationalism. America is a step up. We are an evolution of human consciousness. We must read our founding documents and understand what binds us together as a people is our belief in a certain set of ideas that are enshrined in our documents. And that would be why intellectuals are spending so much time destroying our belief in these documents. Because what they're destroying is what it is to be an American so they can create a new identity that would be a globalist identity. Let's play number six, please. But where did, where did this originate? Well, I think it, it, it all started after World War II, right? I mean, it's kind of like, you know, when you, when you ask, your, when, when we talk about like modern leftism, we talk about like critical race theory, we talk about all these things, all these crazy things that are being taught on college campuses across the U.S. You know, that started, that started in Frankfurt, Germany, in the Frankfurt School. And it was a group of Jewish intellectuals that that manufactured critical theory, which which then turned into, you know, what we know today is critical race theory and basically modern leftism altogether. And after World War II, they fled and, and this ideology infected the universities on the East Coast and then spread throughout the United States. And I think it's it's sort of the same thing with this undying support, undying loyalty for Israel. You know, it has a lot to do with money. It has a lot to do with the most powerful lobby in Washington, D.C. You know, one of the ex-employees for APAC, Steve Rosen, he once said, we can have the signatures of 70 senators on a blank cocktail napkin if you wanted to while he slammed the cocktail napkin down, you know, boasting about the power that they have. And then if you talk about it in a negative way, you're banned, you're canceled. And so it's, it's sort of the same thing where it's, it's part money, it's part power, influence, influencing politicians to do what's best for Israel with money or with like blackmail. Like, you, you know, you talked about Jeffrey Epstein, Ghislaine Maxwell, uh, they were sent here, they were Mossad agents sent here to blackmail very powerful people in the U.S. to get them to do what's best for Israel. And then it's in part like just total brainwashing. You have uh, atrocity propaganda, which has been weaponized which is in, you know, like the Holocaust in every single movie and every single TV and all these TV shows and all these books. And you have mandatory Holocaust classes in, in, in schools. And so, you know, this is used this is used as a weapon so that you do not talk about these these issues. And it's also used as a weapon so that you don't talk about other things like the ma like mass immigration, demographic change, uh, because, you know, you're called a racist. And what do you think about when you're called a racist? What do you think of Adolf Hitler? What did Adolf Hitler did? Well, he killed six million Jews. And this is the reason why you can't talk about. Them. So it's basically the Holocaust is the power source for the force field that is protecting them from 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 criticism. So much truth and half truth. You know, to make um, a story up, it's, it's where you want to get to. Where are we trying to get to? Where am I trying to get to here in, with you in this community is to an inclusive movement of people who believe in a very simple set of American ideas and who work together to restore the republic to try to heal division, because when we divide, we conquer. And there's a lot of truth, but you know, we talk about the Frankfurt School. Well, where did the Frankfurt School come from? We can go all the way back to when Christ said, come hither, Thomas, and thrust your hand into this wound that you might believe. It's wherever you want to set your starting point for your analysis. You know, in, in, in God's time or in God's speed, it's a blink of an eye, 5,000 years of Western history, a blink of an eye. It's all in our heads. And what we have here is a divisive ideology, which is going to be used by the left to demonize a movement of the American citizens to restore our country. And if American citizens look at themselves in the mirror, and they see anti-Semitism or they see racism, they're like everybody else. There's nothing wrong with having it because it's part, it's baked into our cake. What's wrong is not getting up off the mat. This is what put us on the floor. Let's get up now and start to heal this and see ourselves as one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Beautiful ideas like that one nation under God, indivisible. You can't divide and conquer us. We're indivisible with liberty and justice for all. 
everything we need, we have it banging around in our head. It's what we ensue, what we get down inside of ourselves. So what we end up with is a with is a bunch of security state assets saying and doing things which allow the movement to be easily discredited. Elliot, could you please play number seven? Watch this. Watch what the power is doing. We know that American history has not always been a fairy tale. From the start, it's been a constant push and pull for more than 240 years between the best of us, the American ideal that we're all created equal, and the worst of us, the harsh reality that racism has long torn us apart. It's a battle that's never really over. But on the best days, enough of us have the guts and the hearts to st stand up for the best in us, to choose love over hate, unity over disunion, progress over retreat, to stand up against the poison white supremacy, as I did my inaugural address to a single out as the most dangerous terrorist threat to our homeland, is white supremacy. We know. Well, there it is. Uh, there it is. There it is. So the people that are erecting Patton and erecting this, this white supremacy argument which it's not necessarily white supremacy to criticize the Zionists, but it's going to be used that way. Or it's not necessarily white supremacy to critique Israel or certain individuals, American citizens who wrap themselves in Jewishness when in fact they have nothing to do with Jewish history, customs, belief. They're just cultural Jews and they go about their work undermining our country. Yeah, okay, I said it. But when we make it about an entire group, when we make it group-based, we're really playing into a narrative which is going to allow both repression, suppression, and then it will lead to failure. And what we need is the widest possible constituency of American citizens that believe in simple, timeless and appropriate ideas, which we're now becoming very clear about. Well, let me let me share with you how far this goes. Uh, can you play number eight, please? I swear allegiance to Donald Trump. Forget the Constitution. I swear allegiance to Donald Trump. I swear allegiance to America. And I swear allegiance to God and Jesus Christ. That's our pledge. That's our oath. Long live the president. Long live the rightful king of America. We Not a Roman salute, but a regular salute. We salute you, our leader, our hero. God bless you. Pray for our president, our real president. I swear allegiance to Play Donald again. Trump. Forget Play it again. That's good. Let I swear it go. allegiance to Donald Trump. I swear allegiance to America. And I swear allegiance to God and Jesus Christ. That's our pledge. That's our oath. Long live the president. Long live the rightful king of America. We Not a Roman salute, but a regular salute. We salute you, our leader, our hero. God bless you. Pray for our president, our real president. I, I don't know what to say about that um, specifically because I'm not in his head. But he had a kind of a smirk on his face like he was on the payroll and he was reading a script. Nonetheless, that's the... Uh, wannabe famous person, Nick Fuentes, who is aligned with Stu Peters in this anti-Jewish, anti-Zionist effort. Now, do you think that might be used to discredit Professor Penn and everyone in this community that's trying to restore America? Forget about the Constitution. We're loyal to a person and to Christ. You think that might keep people from getting involved with us? I do. I think this is a divide and conquer strategy. I do not know if these people are being paid by the security state, but they're sure working for them, which would make them dumb because if they were getting paid for this, oh, they'd be crafty. Why would we be doing anything? And Stu, you're welcome to come on and talk with me. Royce would love to talk with you. We don't want to force anybody out of the movement. We want to just say, come on, let's build something that Americans can get behind because this isn't going to work. 
This is a small subgroup of racists and anti-Semites that are going to be used to destroy the whole movement. And look at Biden. President Biden is saying that the greatest threat to our country is white supremacy. And there you go. You play right into it. Nice work, boys. Nice work. You know, if you're not on the payroll, surely, surely you're dumb, right? Because why would you do this to such a righteous movement of people who have sacred honor or are trying to develop sacred honor? Let all who believe in our founding documents and believe in America as a land where a creator granted unalienable rights, let all of these people find a home in a movement that refreshes our republic. Please, let us not trap good meaning men and women of good will. Let us not trap them in a failed ideology because they fear the racism and anti-Semitism, which is so evidently on display. Please let us not do that. Let us get beyond this. We can criticize specific people, specific policies. We can ground our criticism in, his, in history and in philosophy, as we try to do here on this channel. And those who have been watching me, and Stu, if you're watching, you go back. I can be very critical of uh, uh, people that claim that they're Jews. Very critical. I have to wonder if I can join the movement because, you know, I'm a Khazar, because I'm a Ukrainian Jew. Maybe you don't trust me because I'm a, maybe I'm a plant, right, by the international Zionist conspiracy, right? You know, I'm going to tell all of you, I'm a perfect potential member of the international Zionist conspiracy, and nobody ever asked me to join. Maybe because I dropped out of the university and didn't join the secret societies like George Bush and John Kerry and Ron DeSantis. I didn't join Yale's secret societies because I didn't stay around to get the tap on the shoulder. And I was on X and, oh my gosh, you know, I brought up that Ron DeSantis had joined a secret society. And he did. You can go look it up. And they go, oh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a weirdo. You know, it's like a, a BS story. No, you dumb ass. When you get enculturated, when you become initiated into a sacred society, a secret society, which has sacred uh, oaths and traditions and histories, you're joining that to be acculturated into a worldview. So you can't escape the importance and salience of membership in these secret societies. And there's lots of them. There's the Jesuits, who we're going to talk about on Thursday. There's a great one. The Jesuits. We have a Jesuit pope. What does that mean? Well, we need to look at it before we blame the Jews for everything. We need to understand that we understand very little about what's going on in this world. I need to understand. I have come to the conclusion that what I've been fed is a line of BS, and I've believed it. Because I voted for George Bush Sr., my first Republican that I voted for, that was in 1992. I voted for George Bush the Jr. And how many of you, Stu, were you even old enough to vote when George Bush Jr. ran for president? Because if you were too young, you were exonerated. You might have been too young. Maybe you didn't vote. I voted. I'm embarrassed by that vote because I was dumb at the time. Well, we're waking up. So let's wake up to an ideology where American citizens can ensue their citizenship and find community, not division. We can't have this division. Let's play number nine. Uh, Americans are, are doing the opposite of profiting when it comes to our relationship and foreign policy with Israel. Uh, I mean, funding the Iron Dome. I mean, hundreds of billions of dollars. I can connect what's going on in Ukraine with Israel. Uh, you can connect everything back to Israel. And so we're just unquestionably, you're not allowed to criticize it, you're not allowed to ask a question, just funding and dumping money and sending military assets and resources and battleships and protecting this, you know, most fortified border on the face of planet Earth while we orchestrate and implement and carry out a physical invasion of our own country. And so when I ask that, I mean, call it who you want to. 
if the chai comms that Alex seems to be very afraid of or the Muslims that Alex seems to be very obsessed with, that's another thing that he liked to say, I'm obsessing, uh, which was, uh, to me, that was gaslighting. I'm not obsessing. I'm identifying an obvious occupation of every single government installation and institution in the United States and in our media. And it's the one enemy that you're not allowed to name. If the Chai Coms were at our border and they were invading us, everybody would go, oh, my God, the Chinese are invading us and we need to go to war with China. If if the same thing with what did he say, Venezuela or the French, they're, they're not occupying our government. They don't dictate U.S. foreign policy, and they're not soaking the taxpayer for hundreds of billions of dollars. Why can't we name this enemy? What makes them so untouchable? Well, there they are together, the Twin Towers of Doom, which, again, makes me think these people are working for somebody. Because when he said that this ideology of the French, he didn't mention the English, the Europeans, are not occupying our government actually he's either dumb uneducated or running a diversion it is precisely the european ideology that is occupying our country and it's not a zionist ideology it's a darwinist ideology and guess what happens jews traditionally because of their uh, many thousands of years emphasis on education because being warriors didn't work for them. They got wiped out. They went into the education business, educate, educating their kids in the law, the history of the Jewish people. Uh, they had a, a predisposition to be good in school. They like to study. They don't like to watch video games. They like to do math problems. Study your math, kids. So these Jews went up through school, junior high school, senior high school. I graduated a year early. High school, graduated third in a class of 1,104 people. Even though I graduated early, I went to an East Coast really big-time university. Again, dropped out, saved myself the indignity of getting in culture, acculturated into this Darwinist worldview. I didn't like it. It's a European worldview, and the Jews got very good at it. Well, let's figure out how the Jews got into it. That's for Thursday night. But it's more than Zionism. It's the European intellectual tradition, which Zionism is part of it. But who, who blessed the Zionist movement? Where did it come from? Oh, well, that'd be the English. That'd be the English. That'd be the Balfour Declaration. So we're kind of putting the tail as the head. Okay, got to start someplace. Let's work on it, Stu and Nick. Let's work on it. Because to believe that these Protestants are without sin, let them cast the first stone. Let's see how it turns out. Because these Protestants who were protesting the Catholic Church, who formed the Westphalian nation states of Western Europe, hey, they were the colonizers. These were the people that enslaved the Africans. Wasn't the Jews. Oh, the Jews financed it. Maybe. Let's go look at it. But the guys that wielded the whips, as I said earlier, the people that enjoyed their work, as obviously... If you're going to be an enslaver, you got to enjoy your work. It's not for everybody to so sit there and whip people. Not everybody can do that, Stu. Maybe you can. I should ask you, Stu, could you whip a slave? I hope not. Okay, if we can start there and work backwards to spiritual borders, assets instead of debt, and end in the wars, we got common ground to work forward. I'm not trying to push you out. I'm trying to engage a dialogue so that we can get by this blaming groups because all these groups have their spear in the blood of inequity. All of them, the Catholics, the Protestants, the Jews, the atheists, the communists, the chai Coms, as you called them, the Muslims. There's nobody on this planet who can sit here and say that they are without sin or separation from the Most High God. So let's focus on internal development, on internal healing for all the American citizens. Let's preach civic participation instead of blaming people and making them feel powerless. We need a miracle, and the first miracle starts within ourselves. So to finish up, I'm going to start a little bit, I finish up with a little 
start into judo or what the Jews need to do. Because I'm Jewish, and I think I know what they need to do. And boy, I got a lot of Jewish people that communicate with me on social media, and they hate me. So we're going to start to talk about that. And um, it's another one of these dangerous things that Professor Penn's engaging in. But, you know, the black people need to take care of their community. The Jewish people need to keep, take care of our community. The Protestant people need to keep, take care of their communities, and so on and thus. The Catholic people need to look at their community. We need to work within our communities and come together, not as a bunch of enclaves of ethno-nationalism, but as one people indivisible with liberty and justice for all. What a great line. Hey, do you know that line, Elia? I'm glad that one made it to the current. You know, General Patton didn't make it. I mean, you know, he's a big name to get uh, deep-sixed, I'm going to tell you. Let's play number 10. Realize that you're the man I've been dreaming of. What do you eat before you go to bed? What experience have you had in a department store? I was a shoplifter for three years. Are you a man or a mouse? You put a piece of cheese down there and you'll find out. Tell me the price of this bed. $8,000. Why, that's preposterous. I can get the same bed anywhere in town for $25. Yes, but not with me in it. <laughs> she looks as healthy as any woman I've ever met. You don't look as though you ever met a healthy woman. What? Uh, Sir? This lady is my wife. You should be ashamed. If this lady is your wife, you should be ashamed. Who's responsible for this? Is this your picture? I don't think so. It doesn't look like me. Well, take it out of here immediately and hang it up in my bedroom. I remember when I was a teenager, and I didn't know who the Marx Brothers were, and was up late down in the basement watching the black and white TV. And here comes the Marx Brothers. I didn't even know they were Jewish until I watched for a while, and then I realized they were, they were Jewish. And they had a kind of a humor and a kind of um, joie de vivre that was unusual. And when I was watching them for the first time in the 60s, they were already long gone as leaders of the you know, entertainment industry. Their heyday was in the 30s and 40s. But their humor was so timeless, and, and uh, I, I would laugh out loud. And I don't laugh out loud very often. I, mean, I remember just, it just, it was just great. Kind of like Richard Pryor. Kind of like Richard Pryor. I mean, actually, kind of like Hunter Thompson, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. When I read that book, I remember I was lying on the grass. I was uh, in my early 20s, and I was laying in the sun, and I was just laughing out loud. It is so funny, and it, it's hard to make me laugh because, as you know, I'm a rather serious person. I like to laugh, and the Marx Brothers made me laugh, and the Marx Brothers made America laugh. They were huge. They were cross-cultural. They, they started out in a, um, it's called the Borscht Belt. It was a very specific Jewish-only enclave of entertainment, but they very quickly broke out into the uh, general audience, and they were beloved. Groucho Marx was beloved, and you know his last name was Marx, so it was like Karl Marx, which was kind of a an oxymoron in a kind of a way. Um, they made a, they made a lot of people very happy. There's uh, about 15 million Jewish people in the world today. It's two tenths of 1% of the world population, which is currently 8.1 billion. Two-tenths of 1%. We spend a lot of time talking about the Jews. You know, it's not really about the Jews. It's about the intellectual tra tradition of believing in one God, the seed of Abraham, because that was an intellectual transformation of human consciousness. And the Jews were given a chance to be a nation of priests, and they screwed it up. And what's the evidence? The diaspora. The Jews were expelled from the Holy Land because they lacked the appropriate spiritual borders to maintain their physical borders. Enough of their hierarchy became what was called Hellenized. They sold out. 
they sold out no different than our current leadership is selling out today, particularly in entertainment. Sellouts. They're sellouts. And if you're not a sellout, as happened to me on uh, X this yesterday evening, someone would say I was a weirdo for pointing out that Ron DeSantis was in a secret society. That doesn't make me a weirdo. That just makes me understand that Ron DeSantis was in a secret society. And because I've been raised in several of them, I know how potent they are. Because this man who criticized me does not know anything about secret societies. Well, there's another side to it. Maybe he's highly trained in a secret society and was trying to, you know, divert the American people. But most likely, he's just never had the tap on the shoulder that I've had or that Ron DeSantis has had to be trained in a secret society to learn a set of skills and values that go back a long way, maybe almost to Abraham, in my case, to Abraham. Maybe in uh, Ron DeSantis's case, just back to the pharaohs. You had to look at each one of these secret societies. You know, it's not hard to figure them out if you do your homework. But you got to do your homework. You know, of course, I've been working on this for a long time. Why it's getting easy is these people are no longer hiding. You see, it's, it's easy for me to understand it now because what was hidden is now revealed. And why is it revealed? These people are sure that they've won, and they're not holding back. That's why you see Satanism everywhere, in popular culture, in music, in art, in movies. It's everywhere because they think they won, and they're sucking up participants. It's like Darwinism. It's not hiding. Almost the entire culture is Darwinist. Our churches are Darwinist. Our synagogues are Darwinist. So I'm going to speak to the community of people that still salute the flag of believing in God. What does that mean to believe in God? It means we believe in God. That's what it means. I will make I statements now. Not we statements. I am seeking to have complete and utter faith in God. I've lived through a period where the shortcomings of man is they're on full display. I do not and I have not ever had confidence in our leaders. I've always known that they are men and my mother taught me and even though my mother does not like my ideology, my mother said good things like All men have feet of clay, and that's true. And as Mike Tyson said, the men that are the most impactful are the ones that are the most tempted. And we can see from the result, from where we're living today, that temptation has been very successful. And I have said, I have been tempted and failed several times in my life, which I think at this point, allows me to be incorruptible or I'm going to, to the best of my ability, to, to the fullness of my strength, I will maintain my faith and grow my faith. And why do I say this? Well, for my own personal salvation. Do I have a hope that our country can be restored? Yes, I do. Have I been blessed to participate in creating a very simple message which I think all American citizens will agree with. Yes, I have, and I thank God for the opportunity to participate in this movement, this restoration of America. But the reason it's so easy for me to see what's going on is, A, because I've been studying it my whole life, and B, and this is the more important one, these people are not hiding. We're on the verge of a cataclysm, and we all intuitively know it. We need a miracle. I need a miracle. Well, for me, the personal miracle is I would like to be saved. I would like to die on my feet knowing I did all I could to defend my faith and my family and my country because I think those things are good. They're good. 
I would like to be good. I want to die being good. So for the Jewish people that are watching me, I love you. Whether you have faith or don't, whether you're a Khazar or not, whether you're Ashkenazi or Sephardic, I don't have any anti-Semitism in me. I have what's called Ahavos Yisrael, a love of the nation of Israel. I love the nation of Israel, and I understand that we've been tempted as a people, and we've succumbed to that temptation. And there are reasons for that. The primary one is fear, because when you suffer a genocide, you'll give up those ideas which led to your destruction. And this has been going on with the Jewish people since the destruction of the temples, that forces have come to destroy the Jewish people precisely because they were erected by the Lord as a nation of priests. So throughout history, tyrants have arisen and have sought to destroy the Jewish people, and the Jewish people, in large part, have given up their faith in an attempt to survive. I know that was important to my mother. And to my grandmother, they wanted me to assimilate and not to maintain the faith as it was practiced by my forefathers because they were afraid it would lead to my death. That's what mothers, I guess, want to do is they want to see their sons survive. So there's two images of masculinity now, one of assimilation and one of holding to the faith. And when I say assimilation, We want to be one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. But that was under God, not under Darwinism. One nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Not one nation under the European intellectual tradition, which is what we've become. So I'm going to say to those of us that believe we have the power to increase our faith, to work inside, interior, not exteriorly blaming others, but trying to bring together a movement of American citizens that are united by these very simple and enduring ideas. There's plenty of blame to go around, and we're going to look at some of it because it really is hiding in these secret societies And we have to understand what's at the root of all of the bad and what's at the headwater of all of the good and understand it in our own way as God reveals it to us in our own hearts. And on that note, I want to thank you for joining today. And I want to go out with um, some music that really, for me, typifies what's so great about creativity and humanity. And I pray that such enduring artistry not be lost through the shortcomings of man's intellectual process. Let's look at what creativity, the gift of creativity, has given humanity. Thank you. Be well. I'll see you on Thursday night.